Oh, that's great. Is Laura here? Oh, oh, okay. Good to see you. Yeah, sorry. Welcome to today's talk. It is beautiful spring day of heaven outside. I feel really cold. Anyway, that aside, is all Dick is fault. They're from Michigan, and that's where it comes from, I think. The rest of the snow. Yeah. Snow, yeah, snow I brought it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm very, very happy to have, we are happy to have Becky here today. Uh, you probably, most of you know, she's been in the University of Michigan for a long time. After finishing in Berkeley, I believe, in 89, was it? That's like right. That. And then she went to Princeton, I believe, for postdoc with Alex Narosky, right? Correct. Before she left. Uh, That's right. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, moved over to, to Michigan, where she has been. Yeah. 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 I didn't want to come. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> and she has a number of interests, and I'm not going to go through them all. Suffice to say that many of those things that she has done and is doing is very close to my own professional heart. Melts, water, interactions, and so forth and so on. So today, I presume she will be applying some of that information to the title of the statement right here. I'm not going to read it because you're going to read it yourself. And it's obvious. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about, um, I think, a couple of questions, uh, addressing a couple of questions that, from my perspective, aren't even being asked, um, and you've got to ask the question before you can answer them. So you'll see what I mean as I, as I proceed. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, the melt generation and eruption of the most differentiated magmas on Earth. So I'm talking about rhyolites that are way up there in silica content, 75 to 77% silica. And they are among the most voluminous supervolcano eruptions as well. So we've had two in the US in the last uh, 1 million years. And I just want to remind, for those of you who aren't familiar, five basic magma types. And I'm talking about the highest silica type, rhyolite. But there's rhyolites and there's rhyolites. And so what I'm focusing on in this talk are the most differentiated, the ones with more than 75% silica. They also have low strontium barium. And again, include some of the most voluminous. And importantly, they're also close to being eutectic melts, which will, which will become important. OK, so mechanisms. To make these huge volumes of highly differentiated melt, there's just two ways you can do it. You either are extracting a melt during crystallization or partially melting something. Um, so those are the two end members. But either way, quartz, potassium, feldspar, and have to be residual. And because we need a eutectic melt composition, again, more on that later. And you got to pull uh, back the barium and strontium. So just some background. OK, so the really uh, interesting question is, what is the time scale uh, for these eruptions? And also, what is the time scale in order to generate and accumulate uh, that much melt of this highly differentiated uh, magma? Well, previous work um, done in uh, for Long Valley Caldera, so this is uh, the eruption of the Bishop Tuck about 767,000 years ago. Um, Colin Wilson and Wes Hildreth, they, they present evidence that the eruption was less than eight days, so less than a week. But the other thing we take away from this is that if there was more than 600 cubic kilometers erupted, and you can see that the, uh, the dimensions of the caldera here is around 200 uh, square kilometers, 20 by 10, then this is the inference is that there has to be about a three kilometer thickness of melt. So 20 by 10 by three, that was all in existence all at once, you know, at least during this eight day eruption. So how long does it take to accumulate that, that kind of volume of melt? And uh, what is the longevity of these giant magma bodies? Well, back when I first showed up, or close to the time I showed up at Michigan, my colleague at the time, Alex Halliday, was arguing that the magma body underneath the Bishop Tuff that fed the Bishop Tuff was around for a full million plus years. And that really got a lot of attention in terms of how do you keep something molten for that long in the cold upper crust. Um, more recently, uh, through looking at zircon crystallization ages, so these are zircons in the erupted Bishop Tuff, and you take their crystallization ages and subtract it from the eruption age, 
uh, people are saying, well, more like a hundreds of thousands of years. 100, 200, 000, something like that. Um, and that's probably the most widely accepted. But more recently, it's been argued that looking at some kinetic features, you know, of different crystals, that maybe as, as low a time frame as less than 10,000 years, maybe only 300 years. So my point here is that it's um, unresolved. There is a widely accepted time. And I'm going to address this question uh, by the end of this talk. OK, so what tectonic setting do we, do we see these two big ones in the US the last million years? In both cases, it's been extension. Um, but what about subduction zones? Uh, what is the occurrence of this highly differentiated rhyolite there? Well, um, most of the big voluminous stratovolcanoes are erupting andesite and dacite, intermediate magma. And uh, again, Liz Hildreth, he did a review, sort of professional paper on the Cascade Arc, and he points out that um, any magmas more silicic than dacite are sparsely and irregularly distributed. And importantly, high silica rhyolite, what I'm talking about here, is, is especially rare. And then you'll really only see it uh, in the rear arc where basin range extension superimposes. Um, we can also go down to the Andean arc, and I point this out because that's a very thick conical crust, and we see more evolved melt compositions there. And here it's mostly dacite. And in fact, for the last 10 million years, there's been 10,000 cubic kilometers of magma erupted, and it's overwhelmingly dacite. And importantly, it's crystal rich, so there's quartz, sanidine, and uh, plage. And so that interstitial melt is this rhyolitic composition. But you can see very little rhyolite has erupted and essentially no high silica rhyolite. So the process of, of that melt extracting out and erupting really isn't, doesn't seem to be happening here. OK, what about the plutonic record? What if we go to the Sierra Nevada backlift and look at, uh, is there any evidence of plutonic equivalence of the supervolcano? Um, well, if you go to the high Sierra, it's overwhelmingly, um, so this is Yosemite and Half Dome. The, the, if you look at the bulk compositions of the rocks, 60 to 71 percent, less than 10 percent is gabbro diorite, less than 12 percent is what I call the true granite or of a rhyolitic composition. And this is a map that was done by, compiled by USGS scientists. And you can see that uh, bulk compositions less than 66 are sort of on the west side. Compositions between 66 and 71 are on the east side. And then stuff more than 71 is sort of sprinkled on both. And this really raises a question of, if you look at the architecture of continental crust, so this is just an average seismic profile uh, result put together by Christensen and Mooney back in 95, and superimpose on that what Roberta Rudnick and her colleagues have inferred about the bulk composition of the different layers of the crust, what we know is that the upper third of continental crust is dacitic. And it raises the question of why don't we have a rhyolitic upper crust? Why, why isn't that happening? Why do we just see a sort of incipient development when we look at the Sierra Nevada? OK, so why is continental crust so strongly differentiated, certainly compared to oceanic crust, but not to its full potential? So in other words, why don't we see these large plutonic bodies, just like what you infer had to have been underneath a long valley? 10 by 20 by 3 kilometers. Why don't we see that? Um, well, it turns out we do find really high silica rhyolite in the Sierra Nevada, but it's only scattered as these what we call apolite dikes. So those white sort of dikes do have high, uh, high silica, low strontium, etc. And importantly, the matrix there, the granodiorite, contains the mineral sphene, calcium, titanium, silica, ox oxide. And the reason that's important is that Alan Glazner and others pointed out that these outlife dikes, and not just in the Sierra, but globally in Bathyllus, have this depletion in the middle of Earth um, because of showing they've ex been extracted from some sphene bearing mag uh, magma. The point is it's a fingerprint that says that what's er compared to what's erupting, the rhyolites that erupt, the outlife dikes look nothing like what is erupting. So it, it supports the inference we've just had you know, gone through, which is that it really looks like interstitial rhyolite melt in these crystallizing dacitic magma bodies doesn't really segregate, at least not in the subduction zone environment. Okay, 
Well, why not? What's stopping these from uh, getting out, especially since we have other environments where they're getting out in gangbusters? Okay. Well, is it because they're eutectic melts? So there's that word again, eutectic. Okay, so what do I mean by this? Well, if you look at the composition of these applied dikes, they're dominated by these four components. And so we can go to the classic phase diagram, pure quartz, pure albite, pure orthoclase. The course was first, all the original experiments for this were done here, geophysical lab by Tuttle and Bowen, and followed up more recently with other workers. But the significance of a eutectic melt is that it's the very first melt to form uh, during partial melting, and it's the very last melt to crystallize during crystallization. And so this is a case we're looking at the pure system and pure water saturated. And so what's really important about eutectic melts, at least in this pure system, is that the boundary between being 100% crystallized and 100% liquid is one degree. And the, uh, the, the depression of the, uh, of the solidus is because of increasing water content. So what's superimposed on here is the solubility of water in the melt with increasing pressure. Okay, so it is the case that these applied dikes are not pure iron, not pure, I mean, not pure uh, end member components. They have a little iron, a little calcium, and so on. What is the effect of that? The first is that the calcium helps to stabilize two feldspars to higher pressures. So it, instead of a minimum, it's a eutectic to shallower conditions. And also the iron, you get a more of a narrow liquid to solidus interval. So it's not one degree, but a temperature interval. So maybe something more like this. And so we can ask ourselves, what happens to an interstitial melt in a crystallizing dacitic magma body? Maybe down in the Andes, or, you know, a fossil dacitic magma body in the Sierra Nevada. Well, we also can estimate the temperature at which these applied dikes were extracted using the zircon saturation thermometer. And so if we put these, uh, that interstitial melt of a crystallizing magma body, by definition, is on its liquidus. So it's perched there at about 700 degrees C, and if it were to ascend, you can see it's going to go through degassing, of water and crystallize. So I think that's the answer. The reason why these water-saturated rhyolites can't get out is because they immediately degas and freeze because they're close to eutectic composition. Okay, so that's the answer to that. So this is why no rhyolite. And it's been argued in the literature that cold hydrous rhyolites can't erupt, only hot dry ones. The problem with that is that the Long Valley supervolcano of highly differentiated rhyolite is as cold and hydrous as those applied dikes. So if we look at the early, what's called the early erupted Bishop Tuff, the part of the eruption that erupted the first couple of days, which is mostly to the south, more than 400 cubic kilometers, uh, the crystallinity is one or six percent mostly, but there are some that get up to 20 percent. Some some parts of the uh, eruptive volume. And nine phenocryst phases are always present. And when I first learned this, I learned this as an undergrad taking field camp out there, I was really impressed that you could have a liquid with 1% crystals, and yet there were nine different mineral phases present. That was really uh, surprising to me. So here they are, and importantly, quartz sanidine to plaids is a three to three to one ratio. That's gonna become important later on. Okay, so uh, by the way, if you go and look at the Sierra Nevada, that less than 10 or 12 percent, that's actually a true granite, a rhyolite composition, it has those exact nine mineral phases. And so what that means is that an equilibrium partial melt from such a uh, rock will have those nine mineral phases on the liquidus, or similarly a crystallizing down magma. So just want to make this point. Okay, back to these guys. Do we have an idea of the temperature? We do from 2 RTM oxide thermometry, and we applied this to the Bishop Top, where 2 RTM oxide thermometry has been applied uh, over time, and individual class can be ripped apart, separate all the iron oxides out, and see what they, all possible pairs. So we've been doing this recently, and so for, we now have over 5,500 pairs, and this is from 12 individual class, five different eruptive units, 
uh, five localities, and we get this range of temperature. I think that range is real. It serves, this is the range um, that is recorded uh, in this melt prior to eruption. Okay, now if we take a look at two individual clasts that contributed to this big uh, compilation, one of them is one of these crystal pore varieties. Okay, an average temperature is 712, and then another one with the same average, but is much more crystal rich. And again, this is a theme I'm gonna hit on again going on, how you can have uh, two different crystallinities uh, with not a lot else being different. How do you get that? The other thing we know from our other work is that the Bishop Tuff obviously is hydrous. You cannot erupt a rhyolite uh, at those temperatures without a lot of water. Mostly five to six, but some get as high as six and a half. So, we look at the average composition between the Bishop Tuff and the Applite Dykes, and very similar, similar temperatures, and you know, why is one freezing up globally over time, you know, all the time, and yet here it's able to erupt. Well, it gets more of a problem when we look at Glass Mountain. So Glass Mountain is a series of domes of rhyolite, most of which quenched to obsidian, erupted as obsidian, hence glass, and these are really differentiated. Uh, mostly 77% silica, the highest strontium is 4 ppm, and 100 cubic kilometers in two, episode, two eruptive episodes, around 2 million, 1 million, prior to the climactic eruption of Bishop Tuff. And you can see sparse phenocrysts um, of quartz and pledge. And again, the same nine mineral phases, most of the domes have 1 to 3 percent crystals, a few others, 6 to 8, and there's one that's up to 20. And iron tin oxides, very low temperatures. So again, same composition more or less, same temperature. Why is it that Applied Dykes kink it out, but Glass Mountain clearly did? Okay, well, what, it gets even crazier. If you look at one of these obsidian uh, flows from, um, and not just one, this is common, of these uh, Glass Mountain uh, flows, Le this is a particular example, less than 1% total crystals, nine different mineral phases. The sanidine, one of the nine, ranges in composition from orthoclase 65 all the way down to orthoclase 31. Now most of the sanidine crystals are less than two millimeters, but there's some that get up to seven millimeters. So it's like, how do you get such big crystals like that? So sparse. But anyway, a bunch of questions. Why are Bishop Tuff and Glass Mountain Rhyolites able to erupt when the Applite Dykes can't? How can you have a near eutectic composition, have 1% crystals sometimes, but up to 20% other times without a real change in temperature? Uh, how can Glass Mountain Rhyolite with less than 1% crystals have sanidine spanning such a huge range of composition and you know how do you get such huge crystal sizes okay so to answer these questions which is analogous to asking how do you get such voluminous eruptions of these super differentiated rhyolites on the one hand but we don't have a rhyolitic upper crust to answer those two questions I need to briefly explain a journey that I've been on with my students really for a while looking at these phenocrys pore rhyolites, obsidians, but also dacites and rhyolites. And uh, we've now uh, worked on uh, 18 different samples ranging from 60 to 75 percent silica that look an awful lot like Glass Mountain. I only have time in this talk to give you one example, but it's one of my favorites. So this is a dacite, 67 percent silica, erupted in the western Mexican arc that is obsidian. It has very sparse phenocris and hardly any uh, microlites. Very low temperature. And modally, my phenocris plus microphenocris, uh, less than 3% total. Plage is less than 2%. We have eight mineral phases here. And this is what the plagioclase looks like in the sample. So looking at traverses rim to rim, uh, we see a anorthite 40, anorthite 10. So that's a huge compositional variation when there's less than 2% plage present. So it's reminiscent of the, what Sanadine's doing in Glass Mountain. And I'm going to just show you the textures of some of these crystals. So an anorthite 40, a nice swallowtail texture. That's a, what we call a diffusion-limited rapid growth texture. 
uh, a really strange texture to the right, a little bit uh, more sodic facets on one side, really weird texture on the other side. Uh, beautiful, this is C, just under NFA 30, beautiful facets. D has the same composition, but it's got weird, we're looking strange. And then at E, swallowtail again, and F. Okay, so how do you grow these large, sparse phenocrysts with rapid growth textures? Well, back uh, 40 years ago, uh, Lofgren and Fenn showed us how to do this. And what they did, this is uh, some plagioclase crystals, large phenocrysts of plage with big hollows in the middle. It's, a, it's again, it's one, one of these rapid growth textures. And he made this by undercooling, what we call undercooling the sample. So what do I mean by that? So remember I was talking about how you have a magma body that's crystallizing. The interstitial melt, by definition, is on its liquidus. It's at whatever temperature it's at, it is at its liquidus. And in order to get an undercooling, in order to get the temperature of that melt to be below its liquidus, you have to somehow abruptly drop the temperature, like 50 degrees or 100 degrees. And in a magma chamber at depth, it's really hard to figure out how you do that. You certainly can't suck all the heat out by conduction abruptly. So, um, but, so just keep that as a conundrum for the moment. But what Lofgren did is he was working on the anodyne albite binary, and he was up at high pressure, water saturated, and he started above the liquidus and just dropped the temperature so it was 100 degrees below the liquidus down to here. He did that within 10 minutes and then held it. And he ended up with the, those big crystals I just showed you. So what he was able to do was get an undercooling where he had low nucleation rate and a high crystal growth rate. So all that high crystal growth could get concentrated in a few nuclei. Okay, and they get, um, and Fenn did the same thing with the alkali feldspar. So they found one to six millimeter size crystals in their experimental charges and growth rates of one to five millimeters <coughs> per day. So this is experimentally uh, shown, but the trick is you have to start above the liquidus and get an undercooling. All right, so now we did some uh, phasic living experiments. So Laura Waters, uh, who um, my graduate student then uh, is now doing a postdoc at the Smithsonian. So she led these uh, phasic living experiments on that day site. And so what you can see is that the composition of plagioclase kind of comes at an angle with the plagioclase end curve. So the most calcic plage is here. We see up to anorthite 40. So by inference, we're inferring that 40 would be, probably be here. And the iron oxides put us in this general region of the phase diagram. So remember, there's two ways to get an undercooling. You can either cool rapidly or you can degas during ascent. So the iron tin oxides and the composition of the minerals really are pointing to a degassing origin. Uh, in other words, the phoenix is growing during ascent rather than the paradigm of them growing in a stalled magma chamber. Okay, so this is what we're imagining happened. Magma is ascending, crosses the liquidus, comes down. And at this point where it's about six or a little bit below water content, we see 19% um, plagioclase abundance. So this is phase equilibrium. Remember, we only have 2% plagioclase in this sample. And so the first question is, how do you get such a wide range of composition? Because it cannot be due to the effect of crystallization changing the melt composition. So it has to be something else. And could it be due to a loss of dissolved water in the melt? And it's well known that this exchange reaction depends very strongly on dissolved water content because of the AX relationships here. So uh, if you're looking at the activity composition relationships, it turns out this depends very strongly on dissolved water. We think, it's our hypothesis, that dissolved hydroxyl groups preferentially complex with sodium relative to calcium which lowers activity of albite and uh, makes a more calcic plage. Irrespective of the mechanism, it's well established experimentally. So when we apply the hygrometer, we can explain this variation with, with just loss of water. Okay, but what's causing such a low abundance of plage? 
remember, we should have, by the end of crystallization, we should have 19% plaid, and it still hasn't gotten down to anorthite 10. And it also just seems to stop. I mean, crystallization doesn't continue. So what could cause that? So why not continue to crystallize? Why 2% versus 19? So what we're hypothesizing is that's because it, it's because of a kinetic hindrance to nucleation and growth that's causing this low abundance. So there's two ways you can quench a liquid to a glass. Now, I, the obvious way is just to cool it really rapidly. And the faster you cool it, the more you'll suppress nucleation and crystal growth. But another way to do that is to lose water. So as you lose water, you increase the viscosity. So if you're losing vis uh, viscosity quickly that way, it's another possibility. So back to obsidian, uh, to Glass Mountain obsidian. So Laura Waters at Smithsonian with Ben Andrews has done another phase diagram for Glass Mountain. And this is just a schematic um, of, of their results. And so importantly, what you see is that there's an interval of sanidine and quartz only. And so what's shaded in pink is the temperature range of the iron oxides. The other important thing is the crystallinity. Plaid seems to come in at around 10% plaid uh, crystallinity. And then once plaid is present, boom, you, you immediately end up half the rock crystallized and then hit the solidus very quickly. So this is where the eutectic behavior really is kicking in. The other important point is the composition of the orthoclase appears to vary strongly with water content in the same way that plagioclase seemed to vary with, uh, with water content. And um, so you can, see, whoop, you can see that here at the solidus, uh, she doesn't see anything more orthoclase uh, poor than anorthite 50. But remember, uh, we see things going all the way down to 31. So we shouldn't be growing anything more orthoclase rich than 50, so how do we get down to 31? Well, first of all, we think that this is uh, what's happening, um, that what's changing the composition of the sanidine in the glass mountain is that hydroxyl groups preferentially speciate with sodium relative to potassium. And the only reason is because potassium is so busy with aluminum. And I'm going to show you uh, phase diagram results that demonstrates this effect. So you can, uh, so this is our hypothesis. And so as this uh, rhyolite is ascending, it comes in and crystallizes just standing quartz, then flags. And the reason it can get all the way down and reflecting lower water contents and a more uh, orthoclase poor sanity because it, it's able to go below the equilibrium solidus because it's going so fast. In fact, we know this rhyolite erupted, right? It erupted with only sometimes 1% total crystals. So there's definitely kinetic suppression. Um, all right. Now, the key to this, the key is that you're only going to get this weird kinetic hindrance uh, in big crystals if the magma begins its ascent uh, above its liquidus, if it, if it starts out without lots of little nuclei. So another set of experiments. Starting, starting with, a, this is a low silica rhyolite, a, a different paper. Starting above the plagioclase in curve. So this initial rhyolitic composition was first purged of all nuclei, taken in a furnace uh, at one bar, really high temperature, and then put into this apparatus, pure water saturated, sitting up there. And both one and two started with where that black dot was. They all had the same beginnings. So. The first sample, one, is held just at the plage in curve for about 48 hours. When you quench it and take a look, it has sparse, very sparse uh, plage because it's, it's just at the plage in curve. If you then take that sample, you redo the experiment, and then decompress it at a rate of around 5 weight percent a day, so water a day, so that's maybe 5 or 6 hours, and then quench it, this is what you get. You get lots of crystals, okay? Tiny crystals. You do the same thing, but with the one that's just a little bit above the plagin curve. This time, it's an order of magnitude slower, so more like 55 hours instead of five and a half. You get glass. You do it just a little bit slower than 0 0.5, 0 0.45, and you get a fairly large uh, crystal. There's 50 microns. 
So it doesn't look exactly like uh, you know some of the microphenocrit the phenocris in the sample, but the, the general trend is there. And so this reminds us of Lofgren's really important point, which was if you want to grow large sparse crystals, and most of us experimental petrologists know this if we're trying to do some element partitioning studies and we know we need a big crystal, we know to start above the liquidus and, and, and do this game. The problem is back in Lofgren's day, people didn't appreciate how much water were in arc magma. So he couldn't figure out, no one could, how would you get such a big undercooling like in a magma chamber? It just seemed really uh, difficult to imagine how you could do it. Now we appreciate the concept of degassing induced crystallization. But you gotta start from above the, the, the liquidus. And by the way, these are quartz phenocris in the glass mountain rhyolites. And I would argue that these are rapid growth textures. Sometimes they get interpreted as resorption textures. I think they're rapid growth. But in the real world, um, not just these experiments where we can hold them above the liquidus, how do, we, how do we get a magma, a rhyolite, to cross its liquidus ab from above? How, how do we get it above its liquidus and then cross it through? We, we already talked about the problem interstitial melt has in a crystallizing day site. If it's crystallizing down and the magma's water saturated, when the melt tries to extract, it's just going to freeze. So how do we get around that? Well, again, let's go back to this diagram. But let's imagine what happens to the liquidus surface when it ever approaches under saturated conditions. So this is in the pure system, but here's eight weight percent water. And so I'm gonna superimpose that on this diagram. So imagine we have this you know, near eutectic composition with a total of eight weight percent water. So if we're deeper than say four kilobars of pressure, then it's gonna be under saturated and the liquidus will now have a positive slope. So imagine what would happen if we have two melts being born at the same temperature, but one is undersaturated and one isn't. Okay, we know the fate of that one. It rises, it's going to freeze up. Those are our applied dikes. But what about one that's born fluid undersaturated? As it ascends, it gets closer and closer to saturation eventually, but it's, as it ascends, it's getting further away from its liquidus. So we call that superheating. Then it crosses the solubility limit, and now as it continues, it's going to eventually approach its solidus, I mean lipidus. Okay, finally. But it's done that with quite an interval where it's been above its own uh, lipidus temperature. We can prove this, we think, looking at the geochemistry and, and the mineralogy. So this is the location of uh, eutectic, you know, four kilobars, say, and this is pure water saturated. When the activity of water is one, that's where it's located. So uh, Johannes and Holt have done experiments at the same pressure, and they just looked at, you know, mix CO2 uh, water, so undersaturated with water. And what happens is that the albite stability field grows at the expense of the orthoclase. This is another proof that dissolved water, if you increase dissolved water, you shrink albite, and orthoclase doesn't care or sanity. But if you lose water, albite grows at the expense. So this lends support to, this, to the concept of sanity and hygrometer. Anyway, so the albite field expands. So what that means is that if a melt is born, is extracted from a quartz, plaid, you know, orthoclase bearing assemblage, whether the magma is crystallizing or partial melting, if, the wa if it's water undersaturated, the composition should have a higher potassium to sodium ratio. Well, we see that. So Glass Mountain has a lower sodium to potassium ratio, more potassium, less sodium than the apalite dikes. But more than that, if it's born at this depth, what then is going to happen? So we know what happens when the activity of water is one, right, it freezes. But what happens if we're deeper and it's undersaturated? And so the activity of water is less than one and the melt starts to segregate out. It's going to have a composition here relative to there. Okay, then it rises and it hits fluid saturation. At the point saturation is hit, the activity is one. So all of a sudden, it finds itself not at the eutectic, but along the cotectic. So then when it continues to rise and crosses its liquidus, it's going to
do cotective crystallization of standing quartz. Remember the three to three to one proportion we saw in the Bishop Tuff. Then it hits plage and, and then chokes up. Okay, so just reminding you of that, that behavior there and that proportion of the Bishop Tuff. So what we think, and again, you see this much lower potassium to sodium ratio with the early Bishop Tuff versus the Appalite Dites. So, and then here are phenocris from of, of quartz uh, crystals, phenocris in the Bishop Tuff. Again, uh, rapid growth textures, not, not resorption, rapid growth. So what are the implications? Um, ones that have taken us a while to be brave enough to articulate in public, but we're feeling brave now. Um, first, I think we now understand, you know, of, of everything I've gone over, I think we now understand why the upper condyle crust is not rhyolitic. Um, it's not in the textbooks that it's day site and it's a bit of a question, but um, I think it is interesting and I think we now know why. Okay. We also know why the Long Valley rhyolites were able to get out, um, unlike the Appalachian dikes, because they must have been born water undersaturated. Uh, secondly, we can understand what controls the abundance. Why is it that some parts of Glass Mountain and Bishop Tuff have 1% total crystals, and other 20%, and the temperature really isn't very different? Maybe it's just the kinetics, the time of the ascent. The other thing, and this is what uh, is kind of radical, is that these large sparse phenocris are not growing in a magma chamber stalled at depth over long periods of time, but they're growing during transit to the surface. And if that's all true, then the Long Valley rhyolite could not have stalled that 10 by 20, 3 kilometer melt body, couldn't have been sitting there for, for I, I don't see how it could have been stalled for even a month. Because if it did, it would have started to nucleate lots of tiny little, would have crystallized up or would have started nucleating, even if it had the right thermal gradient, the right water, would have been nucleating those little tiny nuclei. So that when it did erupt, it should just choke, just like the Appalite dikes do. <coughs> so we don't think that this could have been long lived. And within a week or two, we think um, there would have been problems. And we think that the, uh, the, the rapid growth textures is a sign of uh, diffusion limited growth and the crystallization is happening as the magma is rising to the surface. So when we look at these different time scales, we're actually suggesting we're talking about less than a month. And I actually think it's actually, if you want to know what I really believe, I think it's the time scale of the eruption itself. I think eight days is what we're talking about. I think the melt is, is, by generated, I mean extracted from its source, from its, you know, mush, whether by crystallization or by partial melting, extracted and, and just goes pretty much straight up and erupts. These are the zircon crystallization ages from the early Bishop Top. And it's been mostly interpreted that they're growing, you know, in a long-lived molten magma reservoir. So this is what dates the longevity of the reservoir. But we're wondering if maybe it's dating small volume emplacements into the upper crust that freeze up. And so we've been doing a, a, a thermal modeling um, of what happens when basalt invade the granitoid crust, and in, this, in the bisate region it's, it's especially thick, uh, during extension the first basalts and sills will freeze in, and it's not just heat that's going to get transferred, it's also water. And so in a collaboration with uh, my colleague Eric Hetlin and a shared student, we're looking at what happens. I just want to show you one little thing uh, that allows us to make some sense of the zircon crystallization ages. If we just choose an emplacement rate of 50 meters every 10,000 years, and we can look at different rates, randomly emplaced, what we see is that, you know, that the ambient temperature starts to heat up in, in this volume, mixed, mixed volume, mixed lithology volume of the crust. And if we look at after half a million years when the ambient temperature of the crust is only a little over 500 degrees C, what we see is that when you first put in a, a sill, the margin of the sill, and so this is one meter from the sill, 5, 10, 15, the margin of the sill 
sees temperatures between 700 and 800 degrees in the first 100 years. And so if the, the ambient temperature is 550, 600, it's going to be even more. So what this implies is that well before the ambient temperature in the crust is, is 700, there are going to be small volume partial melts that are going to form. And if they can segregate, they're going to start to come up here and freeze up slowly over time. So we're just wondering if that isn't what those zircon crystallization ages are, are recording. Because also, there are zircon ages in the Bishop Tuff that go back to uh, the Mesozoic. So we know zircons can get uh, retained. And then you're going to have a, a, a volume of rock which is near eutectic. And so the question we're asking ourselves is, what would happen if a swarm of basalt, a lot of basalt in a short period of time, invaded that true granite? And, uh, and with that, I'll, um, I'll just leave you with that uh, sort of open question and thought about what might really be triggering um, these supervolcano eruptions. It resolves this dilemma, what causes long-lived large magma reservoirs to erupt? I mean, if you talk to the people who, who uh, study bubble growth and uh, explosivity eruption of volcanoes of these magma reservoirs, it's, it's a dilemma. Why does Yellowstone, you know, have these tap this reservoir quietly and then suddenly go explosively? You know, wh what causes that? And if the whole concept and paradigm of a big long-lived magma body is not right, what controls whether you have a small volume eruption or a big one is the influx of basalt. It just sort of changes the question. Anyway, I will leave it at that and take your questions. Yes? How does the water get in there? How does the water get into the... Into this uh, dry lighter? I think it's, it has to be coming from the basalt. The, the Long Valley basalts are, are actually quite hydrous. Um, they, they, they look like they have five, six weight percent water themselves. So, well, well, you ask a really, so when, when people ask me this question, I will tell you what doesn't work volumetrically, which is to the amount of basalt that you need to generate this volume of rhyolite melt with these water contents by crystal fractionation, you need way more basalt. Than, than this mechanism, a lot more. So because you have the whole mass constraint, you're, you're deriving most of it from the basalt itself. So the, the mass volume relationship, the problem is, is, is there. Um, another question people ask me is, um, you know, how can you generate so much melt all at once? The amount of basalt you would need is crazy. And I said, yeah, but the amount of basalt you would need to keep that melt lens there for even 200,000. So all of us who heat your homes, if you're good and you turn the heat down at night and then turn it back up in the morning, you have a lower energy bill than if you keep it ramped up through the night. You know, so it's the same argument. So yeah, it takes a lot of energy. So the basalts are the source of heat, for sure. But we know that all of these highly differentiated supervolcano rhyolites have to be coming from a quartz, pledge, sand, you know, source rock. Those rocks, if they're subsolidus, are bone dry. You know, they have the, the amount of water a plutonic rock can hold is held in its ferromags biotite horn blend. And the more differentiated it is, the, the less. So the water has to be coming from these basalt. So I think the, the, the exciting part is marrying the, um, the modeling, the thermal, the geophysics, with the um, perspective brought by the geochemist and the petrologist. Yeah? So if most of your water is coming from, from the basalt, then roughly speaking, you've got comparable amounts of uh, basalt as you do have your rhyolitic melt. You surely do. So there ought to be a geophysical evidence for that. Well, there's the certainly. Or, or from yeah. So you see it geochemically. So you see the influence of the basalt geochemically. And um, so what I didn't have time to go into is that what I think is important is that what gets partially melted is a mix of the frozen basaltic sills and the granitoid. So when it starts to heat up, if you're at 700, 750 degrees C, assume fluid saturated conditions in the upper crust, so common pH2O, the granitoid is going to have a higher melt fraction than any basaltic sills that are present. 
But at some point, the basaltic sills, the, the plutonic, you know, amphibolites, are going to start to partially melt. Like, they might be a 5% partial melt when the surrounding granitoid is like 30% partial melt. And those melts are going to, to mix. So you're going to see that geochemical signature, which we do. But as far as the, the geophysical evidence, the best evidence is along the Snake River Plain. And between 15 and 25 kilometers depth, you see a beautiful uh, high resolution of of what is intermediate seismic uh, uh, velocities between what's above and what's below. And it's been interpreted as the mafic dike and sill complex that, you know, um, and it's at that depth, 15 to 25 kilometers. Um, so, well, that, that brings the second. If you want to bring all this volume of material up to the surface within a month, why, oh, why haven't you brought up huge amounts of country rock? So, so, so what I'm saying is that there's a long period of time where basalt is being invaded in advance. You know, in fact, we can take this uh, input of basalt into this area three million years ago. And there's a, it's most of these areas, by the way, where you see a lot of high silica rhyolite in volume, it's bimodal. So you see basalt erupting and you see rhyolite erupting, but very little in a routine. And the classic, of course, is Yellowstone. And, and so basalt is definitely coming into the crust and, and then we're gradually heating it up. And so if I, if I can go to the Yellowstone as an example. So one of the things that's puzzled people is that if you look at Yellowstone the last two million years, three huge eruptions and then lots of more minor ones, you know, domes, flows, small volume. There's really no difference in the composition of the melt, the water content, the temperature between what's erupting as a small volume and what's a huge explosive eruption. And so what I would suggest is that what's triggering all of those eruptions, the small ones and the big ones, is each one is, is reflecting an input of basalt that drove partial melting, generation of the melt, that then it, if it was a little bit of basalt, then it's a small volume of rhyolite. It's a buttload of basalt, then it's a big eruption. The big eruptions are rare. But it's still partial melting, so why haven't you got any evidence for the material that was melting? I mean, you're well, I think we, geochemically we do. Yes, but, but you've mm -hmm. told us that these stuff are pus, varsity, crystalline. Yeah, That's they're segregating. The how, how do you do that so quickly? How do you, how do you segregate the melt? That quickly. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think these are really good questions. And I would just take those really good questions and marry it Pair them with, I think, the questions I've raised. That, that's all I think, and that's when it gets exciting. It's like, how, how can you do this? It's like, that's a good point. How can you do this? And, and I also think it's really important to step back and look at the rock record. The rock record is screaming at us that in subduction zone environments, this, that is not where high silica rhyolite erupts. And that's also where, on the average, the, the fate of basalt is to stay deep. There, there's a reason why continental crust is compositionally stratified, and the lower one-third is basaltic. It's because most of the basalt that's generating the arc mantle wedge ends up in the lower third of the crust. A little bit gets in the middle, even less in the upper crust, and even less erupts. So I think that, you know, the, the basalt is at the scene of the crime. You know, it's, it's clearly getting into the upper crust and it's erupting. It's, you know, we see this bimodal character. The intermediate stuff is nowhere to be found. And when you see the intermediate material, 10 million years of history in the Alta Plana Puno region, and even longer millions of years of history in the east side of Sierra Nevada, there's just a profound failure for that interstitial melt to successfully erupt. So that's, that's just, it's exciting when there's questions that seem puzzling, but you got to pair them with other ones. Yeah. So, sort of to follow on from that, I'm, I'm struggling with this idea of the superliquidous temperatures. For that yep. to be true, that means that you've segregated the melt already. Yep. Because if it's sitting in its intermediate composition matrix, you're not going to be a eutectic Exactly. So you do have to do this step of segregating a high silica rhyolite yep. before you start doing the whole eruptive phase of it. Yep. And so that's what you're suggesting is happening in a very short time. Scale. Exactly. So the time of melt segregation to eruption. Now, so Wes Hildes, for example, he has long argued that the crystals you see in the Bishop Tuff 
post-state the, um, the compositional gradient, because they see 77 down to 75. So he's long said that post-state, that the crystals are after that. And, but, you know, when people look at the zircon population, most of the zircons are in that reasonable, but you do get some that go way back, you know, that they know are inherited, yeah. inherited. Right. So, so that's what I'm, so when people are, when we're talking about the time scale, everyone's talking about the time scales of the phoenixers growing. And so that's what we're saying is, and, and I bring to this uh, 10 years of fooling around with these phoenixers poor, there's, it, at ARCS, there's a tendency to go to the big stratovolcanoes and ignore what the peripheral eruptions, but you can find plenty of cinder cones, fissure fed flows of andesite that are phoenicris poor, 2% plage, 35 mole percent variation in plage, swallowtails, you know, you see it over, no one looks at that though. So that's why we, we were, when we started focusing on Glass Mountain, we thought, I've seen that before. That you just know. means if you're segregating, you know, 400 to 600 cubic kilometers of magma, mm -hmm. and that's coming out of something that's a partial melt zone. Right. That means your partial melt zone is huge. Right. But we've always had the huge problem. So the, getting back to the energy budget, people say, how do you do this? I'm like, it's worse. The, the, the energy budget, the volume budget is worse if you go to the paradigm for how it's... Well, yeah. The, the, this mm, dominant paradigm now of the large yeah. magma chamber just sitting there, the energy budget of that is worse. Yeah, and also the yeah. material budget because, so people have, um, so again, when I first arrived at Michigan, Alex Halliday was working on this, and I had gone to field camp and had Ian Carmichael, West Hildreth's advisor, um, explained to us that, oh yeah, it's, you get 1% crystals, 9 mineral phases, that's easy, you partially melting from the granitoid up there. You know, so he, he explained it. And then, uh, you know, both Don DePaulo and, and Alex Halliday began to give the isotopic signatures and saying, the Bishop Tuff is not reflecting a straight up partial melt of the Sierra. Um, and if you look at the Long Valley basalts, they're, they're a good match for the Long Valley basalts. So then they start saying, oh, crystal fractionation. But then you had the problem of driving the strontium down to like, and so again, it got into the a real paradox of how you do that, not to mention the absence of the intermediate. And the mistake everyone makes, I can't tell you how many field trips I've been on, which in the Sierra Nevada and, and Mammoth area, where they say, here's the, uh, the Pluton is the, you know, where Long Valley came from, you know, that here's the, here's the Plutonic equivalent, and then this is the stuff that's extracted from it. And, and that's just not the case. The rock record tells us unequivocally it, 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 it's not, you know, it's not what's happening. Anyway. Questions? Then I have one. Yes. How do you make a basalt at 5% water? Uh, I think, well, you can do it in, um, in certainly a subduction zone environment. So. <coughs> Well, I think once the water is lost, I mean, we yeah, see I mean, a lot my of. My point is, uh, <clears throat> you have this, have you had a source of salt, source of water being a basalt, salt rock with it, probably like five percent water. And I want, want to know where that water comes from, because if you partially melt and you have to melt with five percent water in the melt, it's going to be salt. Well, I think uh, a lot of basalts um, yeah, have been it's documented. The olivine. Melt inclusions in in lots of our basalts. I think the highest in basalts yeah, I is. I had the opposite question. I was like, how do you, how are you not water saturated actually given right. the evidence for how much water is? So you're saying that the water is actually an enrichment process during crystal section of basalt. No, no. The basalt. Well, what's interesting here is that these basalts. Um, this is extension. This is not active subduction. So. Everyone has argued that the uh, basalts around Long Valley are coming from subduction modified lithosphere that was hydrated during a long history of subduction. Um, and then it's somehow getting uh, partially, the subduction, mo the subduction modified lithosphere is getting partially melted because of thinning of the lithosphere and decompressional melting of the asthenosphere. 
and so um, so that is um, you know involved. And interesting about the Yellowstone track because when the Yellowstone uh, rhyolites first start at 15 million, 15, 16 million years ago, they're they're hotter and drier. And as you move to the present, they're they're more hydrous. They're 850 uh, plus or minus and you know three percent water. Whereas at Long Valley, I mean they're they're five and six weight percent water and down you know, 700, 760, there's no doubt. And if they're that cold, they need the water. So the water, um, and then the, uh, there's been some work done on the Long Valley basalts to show that they, it really looks like they have high water too. Um, anyway, I think it's a good question about how a, a subduction modified lithosphere can get a basalt that has so much water. But, um, Subduction has been gone, uh, turned off for quite a while in this area. Um, so uh, it's got to be the basalt, I think. Anyway, it's always a good when there's these new questions. Um, Anything else? Okay, then. Okay, thank you. One big point, also, who cares to join us for lunch? The evening in ACC, not here. Okay? Why is that? Because we're celebrating a postdoc meeting. Oh! oh. 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 That's why. Right. So we decided to move the lunch to ACC instead. In about you know, 10 minutes' time. Thank you. That was great. So I had only one question.